Radio check, radio check, radio check. This is the Explorer's pod over. Four, three, two, one. Excellent. Hi, Emma. Good hello. morning. Hi. Hello, hello. All right, so welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Very appreciative you could make it. How are you? I'm good. A little bit tired in my legs. Um, I'm training for my next expedition, and it's a lot of work right now. Wow. That's good to hear. All right. What's the next expedition? Getting a little ahead of ourselves, but since you brought yeah. it up, give us a little of the details. <laughs> well, I hope it will be possible, uh, but the plan is to go to Pakistan this summer mm -hmm. and try to climb my first 8,000-meter mountain. Wow. wow. Congratulations. That is you can really say that awesome. afterwards. <laughs> what, what, what mountain are you attempting here? Uh, Broad Peak. Okay. Uh, wow. Far out. Good nice. on you. <laughs> well, um, Emma, thank you very much for your time. Welcome to our show. And we are very excited to meet you and hear your stories. And to start, tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a little bit of a background uh, for our audience to know. Yeah, so I grew up in the forest in Sweden in a super tiny place. It lived like 30 people there. And um, I was not that into adventures or mountains at this time because there weren't any where I grew up. It was flat. Mm -hmm. um, but I did found a video camera in my parents' closet and I decided that I wanted to become a director and photographer. So that was the path my life was taking uh, from when I was a kid. And uh, I started photographing concerts and uh, I became a photographer pretty early in my life. And that was what I was working with. And um, by the years, um, I started making photography tours and they became more and more adventurous. And then one day I was on a plane to New Zealand to do research for a photography tour I was having there. and. Uh, I watched this movie Everest. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it, but it doesn't yeah. end up well. Uh, <laughs> but it didn't matter because the feeling I had in my body when I saw this movie was like, oh my God, I have to start climbing mountains. All right. Um, which is basically not the reaction most people are having. Sure. And uh, I didn't know how you did that. I didn't even knew that someone like me could climb mountains because all the stories I heard about people climbing mountains, it was super hardcore men and uh, not some, you know, regular scary stuff. Sweden. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, um, that was maybe four years ago now. And okay. um, it turned out that I was um, I was uh, climbing my first mountain a couple of months after this experience. I just had to get married and divorced before that could happen. You know, <laughs> there are okay. uh, yeah. more mountains in between mountains. <laughs> exactly. It was exactly like that. So uh, let's talk about a 49 peaks in a year project. Wow. Can yeah. you give us a background yeah. about how, this? How did you conceptualize such an idea? Was this immediately after your epiphany that you were going to become a mountain climber? That You just said, I'm going to... Um, how did that come It was about? a little bit later. I had climbed two mountains before this happened. Uh, Mount Whitney in California, mm. Mm. Um, the Mountaineers route. It was my first big mountain, and I just loved it. Great mountain. And then I climbed Mount Tupal in Morocco uh, six months later. Mm -hmm. Far out. So in the summer of 2017, I went on an expedition to Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe, in Russia. Yeah. And when I came home, uh, I was restless and I felt I need a project. Okay, so I climbed the highest mountain in Europe. Uh, what if I climbed the highest mountain in every country in Europe? And um, I thought, is that even possible for someone like me? Like, how difficult is it? Mm -hmm. So I started to do research on all the mountains, like, what mountains is there? I mean, what's the highest mountain in uh, Kosovo, for example? Mm -hmm. Or what's the highest mountain in... Uh, um, Austria, I didn't even know, you know, so I just did two hours of research to see what's the highest mountain, how difficult is it, can I climb it, and I just decided I'm going to go for it, I'm going to try. Okay. And um, 
The next day, I booked a ticket to go to Sweden's highest mountain, Kebnekaise, to climb mm -hmm. that. Uh, and the weekend after that, I climbed Mont Blanc in uh, France and Italy. So, yeah, it was a spontaneous idea. And I just immediately, after getting the idea, started a project. So that was maybe a little bit crazy, but uh, that's the way I like it, you know. Yeah, it's a pretty incredible endeavor and uh, quite an amazing twist to your story from fashion photographer, I'd say. Um, when, yeah. when you made that shift and you started to go out on these uh, expeditions, did you really focus as well on, on making photography part of that trip? Well, I love to document my trips and to share with others. That's like one of the best things I know in life is to inspire others and to help others to also do things that they love to do to follow their passion. So I just documented everything for that purpose. So it wasn't, and it isn't my job to photograph in the mountains. That part of photography is only for passion and for pleasure for myself. And I like to have a little bit of photography for just that purpose, you know, mm -hmm. that it doesn't have to be a client, you have to deliver something to, you don't have the pressure to do something unless you want to, uh, because I still work as a photographer, that's how I support myself, you know, and um, I do still fashion photography and portraits and lifestyle and everything, so photographing in the mountains, that's pure pleasure. All right. So when you were a fashion photographer, how, you, that started out as you were you got involved with shooting rock concerts, a rock photo or something like that. How many yeah. years did you put into that career before you before you made the big shift to climbing and uh, adventure sports? So, I mean, I started doing photography when I was 19, like serious. That's when I found the rock photo. And then I photographed 3,500 concerts in less than wow. 10 years. You were a yeah, party animal. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot more to you. <laughs> yeah. And then I just felt, okay, if I have to photograph one more singing songwriter, just sitting on a chair playing guitar, I don't want to do this anymore. So mm -hmm. that's when I turned into fashion photography around 2011, I think. And uh, climbing mountains, i only been doing that for three or four years. So it's been mm -hmm. very recent. Okay. Um, it's a new chapter in my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, congratulations. Great place to be. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a place where you can find everything. Yeah, you find your... Sad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little bit sad I didn't discover it earlier, actually. Uh, it would be great to, you know, just grow up, in, grow up in the Alps or something. But that wasn't the reality for me. Yeah, it's funny how yeah. some people just find it or fall into it. We we interviewed a girl, uh, Heather Anish Anderson, a few weeks back, and she's uh, through trekked uh, the Appalachian Trail, the Cascade, uh, Great Pacific yeah. Trail, all these, and she's like a world record holder. But she was not into sports. She didn't even know about trekking or climbing until she was, you know, in her early twenties, and just did a trek one day. I'm like, wow, I fell in love with it. And then same. Yeah is your story just went for it so yeah, yeah. pretty cool well, stuff amazing. well yeah. i think people should do that more often if they find something they're passionate about they should just go for it <laughs> yeah well um since we're talking about your shift from fashion photography to mountaineering i'm very curious in how did you adjust because i think the the culture and the crowd are uh, totally different i would say know, a little from, bit yeah. Fashion yeah. photography, you know, with all the glamour and elegance and, you know, you have to be flawless. Oh, <laughs> and then you go to mountaineers, like rough campings, like always dirty. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I how, know. How did you adjust? <laughs> well, it wasn't hard because, I mean, even if I work in the fashion industry, I never felt like I was part of it. That wasn't my home, you know. And I'm much more comfortable sleeping in a tent on an expedition for two weeks, not having a shower. So it was kind of natural, actually. And what I felt was that the outdoor world was so welcoming. And that's the yeah. opposite of the fashion. Great community. community yeah, it's a great community. Yeah. And everyone is so nice and they want to help you out. And yeah. I just love that. So that felt like home immediately. And uh, I'm just so thankful for discovering this world. You know? Cool. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> So, Thank you. jumping back to your uh, 
your 49 climbs. You did more than that in one year. Didn't it turn out yeah, to be 61? 61. So, um, I took the same list as um, almost everyone else who have done this project. I mean, there's a book by some British adventurers that have done this before. So I just copied that list. Okay. And then I was thinking, okay, uh, people, they are going to say like, oh, you did the highest mountain in Denmark, but what about the Faroe <laughs> Islands? So I just added a couple of more. Um, and then it turned out to be 61 in the end. Um, and at the same time, um, when I was doing this project, I needed a goal, you know, because a project like this can take forever. It's a yeah. huge project. I mm -hmm. mean, the logistics only are a big puzzle to solve, you know. Uh, so I decided I'm going to do it in less than one year. And what I didn't know at the time when I decided this for myself was that the world record was maybe two and a half years or something. Yeah. Oh. So it was quite ambitious. Okay. And during this year where I climbed these peaks, I also went to Peru to climb four or five thousand meter mountains. Mm -hmm. And I went on an expedition to Aconcagua to try to climb the oh. highest mountain in South America. So it was a quite busy year. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that sort of leads Amazing. into my, my next question was uh, during this project, what was the hardest part? Was it, you know, logistics, the climb? What were the major pitfalls and setbacks along the way? Um, yeah, so I think it was the logistics. I mean, when I started planning for this project, I obviously had almost no experience, but I made a list like in this order, I'm going to climb the mountains. And then I went to the first mountain and after that it became a snowstorm in the Alps. So everything just <laughs> turned upside down right from the start. And that's when I learned the hard way, like you can't really plan the way you want in the mountains yeah. because you have to adjust to to um, um, to the, the current stuff. events, the weather, the whole situation yeah. is always changing, right? You yeah. can't climb the mountain if the weather's not right, so on and so exactly. forth. Right? I mean, I did climb a few mountains in really bad weather, in storms, in rain. I got lost on Scarfell Pike in England, you know. <laughs> I, I've done so many uh, mistakes and I've done so many. I mean, I learned so much during this project. And that's also why I love doing projects, because if you decide I want to go and climb this mountain, you are totally passionate about it. I wasn't that into going climbing like the mountains in Eastern Europe. and some mountains uh, in the 49 Peaks project, they were parking lots, you know? It's like, oh, you park your car, you're there. <laughs> there was yeah. no climbing at all in yeah. some cases, you know? Uh, or maybe there was like a 200 meter path to walk from the parking lot to the highest point in Lassiva or something. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that when you have a project, uh, you're forced to go to these places anyway, you know? And I had this, really emotional and strong experience in Bosnia. That's a country I would probably never visit if it wasn't for this project. But oh my God, it was so beautiful. But it right. was also so sad because you were driving through these small villages and there was still bullet holes in the houses, like mm. thousands of them everywhere from the war, you know? Wow. And you pass these big fields with big monuments from the war. and. In the forests, there are signs with skulls on, like, don't go here, there's mines in the forest mm -hmm. still, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And to see all of this with your own eyes, things you, you know, watched on TV when you were a kid or learned about in school, it was so humbling. I mean, you get so humble. And I think the emotional journey you do on a project like this is so rewarding, you know? Sure. Yeah. But yeah. logistics were, yeah, the hardest part, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And you could just to imagine. time everything right. I did read that you, you did have a sort of a program growing where you invited people to join you on the climbs. And that sort of ended. And I think it was a logistics problem because you just couldn't match up people's climb dates with, you know, your, yeah. your schedule was always changing. That sort exactly. Of got, that was the thing. Like, you always have to be flexible, like, okay, it's perfect weather on Monte Rosa in Switzerland. I have to do that one right now. Or mm -hmm. like climbing the highest mountain in Iceland, it's only possible in April and May. And then the crevasses get too big, so you can't climb it afterwards. So you have to, in this narrow window, get it done. And the mm -hmm. weather on Iceland is 
crazy. So you have to be standby to go just when you see a weather window. So yeah, yeah it was impossible. <laughs> well, we all know summits uh, start as attempts uh, and that uh, always leaves some of the summits unclimbed. In the end of that year, how many summits did you succeed and how many were unclimbed? Um, so let's see. Yeah, the first one I didn't succeed on that I had to come back to. That was Kebnick High actually, the highest mountain in Sweden. Really? But I think there was some kind of, yeah, because I got fever. So oh, when I woke up in uh, base camp I read that. Uh, on the summit right. day, I had high fever and I decided to try anyway. But after two hours, I was just like, this is stupid. And also I have a trip to Mont Blanc next week. I have to go home and get healthy and okay. be ready for that. So that one I had to do again, but that was perfect because then I could end in my home country, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a mountain, maybe it was uh, Albania. Um, we were like at one hour from the summit and then it was a big storm with lightning and hail and it just became totally crazy. And we hid out uh, under a rock for two hours, maybe waiting for it to pass but it didn't so we had to go down and then we had to come back up the next day for montenegro it was yeah montenegro mm -hmm. okay um but other from that i think all the other ones were climbed in the first attempt okay. maybe i don't recall everything but um i think so yeah uh, congratulations the extra mountains uh, i think the extra mountains like aconcagua i turned around um a few hours before the summit mm -hmm. i was at 6400 meters but it was so cold that day minus 40 wind chill oh, and wow. my hands and feet were frozen and i didn't want to risk frostbite so i turned around and uh good that call. was the good decision yeah <laughs> i climbed it a few years later you so. got your fingers <laughs> you have to give it back. Fine. Yeah, yeah, good and job. Toes complete. <laughs> Close to, yes. Yeah. But I do have really cold hands and feet, and that's a big problem in this sport, you know. So mm -hmm. I'm right now researching like boot heating systems for this 8,000 meter peak because I want to come home with all my toes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's do that. Bring those digits home. <laughs> well, yeah. speaking mm -hmm. of the 8,000 meter that's coming up, um, uh, well. During my Everest uh, attempt, me and my teammates, we spent three years in training for that. And yeah. so how, tell us more about um, what's coming up for you, how long is your training, and do you have any upcoming goals aside from that? Yeah, and did you do any sort of like uh, mountaineering schools or did you do any spe specific training as well? Yeah, so... Um I did like this basic mountaineering course uh, before my 49 Peaks project. Mm -hmm. But after this project, um, it was hard to go back to my regular life. So I just took my van that I invested in. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's the best thing I ever bought. All know? right. Good uh, job. It's a bank's van for another seven years, but then it's going to be mine. Um, so yeah, I just took my van, I drove to the Alps, and then I hired a mountain guide and said to him, teach me how to be independent in the mountains. Because I climbed with guides a lot the first couple, the first year, you know, when I had um, more difficult mountains, because I started getting tired of taking the easy way to the summit. Uh, just walking on a path wasn't that challenging and I wanted to develop. So I started climbing bridges and I learned to ski, just to ski a couple of mountains and everything. And it was great to go with guides, but then they did all the work for you, you know, yeah, and I right. wanted to learn this so I could do it myself. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, an amazing day in the Alps. And then I just started training with climbing partners and I led mountain climbs like the Matterhorn by myself. And um, that was really a rewarding experience and I learned a lot. So ever since then, I've been climbing by myself uh, or with partners. and. Uh, I only use guides if I want to do something really technical and push my limits a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've been working on uh, yeah, good job. knowledge that, and experience and getting better and learning more things in the mountains yeah. ever since. And I've been pretty active climbing. I mean, after the 49 Peaks project, I decided to take on the next continent. And I decided to climb the highest mountain in every country in the Americas. 
like both North, South and Central America. And I started doing this project and I climbed almost 40% of the mountains, but then I decided to not do it anymore, to not continue with this project because I felt on one hand that this is not what I want to do because many mountains were out in the jungle. I okay. spent three weeks in Brazil with the Yanomami tribe to climb the highest mountain in Brazil that is out in the middle of nowhere in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. Wow! And even if that was like a super cool experience, I wanted to do alpine climbs. Yeah. So I just felt that I wasted my time climbing in the jungle. And it's I mean, different. I went on some really crazy adventures in Central America, like mm -hmm. climbing the highest mountain in Haiti. That was crazy, but it was not what I wanted to do. And then also there was this environmental reason like i live in europe and it's not i didn't feel okay having this big project on the other side of the world that demanded me flying over the atlantic ocean so okay. many times yep. it's not good in, for the environment so mm -hmm. i decided i'm going to shut this project down and i'm going to focus on something more local instead so i've been climbing a lot in the alps and i mean the last year i was supposed to climb all the 4,000 meter peaks in the Alps. But due to Corona, that didn't happen. So we postponed that until next year. So that's next year's big project. So, uh, I mean, training hasn't been what I was hoping for the last year because of the situation in the world. But I did go to Sweden's highest mountains this summer and I climbed all the 2,000 meter peaks in Sweden. Uh, oh. That's <laughs> the highest mountains we have. Yeah, I saw a video um, today. You were with a, a girlfriend of yours, and you were both climbing. A tra you were doing a traverse across the pretty spectacular route. It just snowed. It was late October. It was a day in the life with you. But it was just you two girls uh, uh, putting in your pro, laying the lines, doing the whole project. I thought it was really cool. So good on you. I'm glad to hear that you're actually laying wow. your pro and doing all your stuff because that's real stuff. That's really climbing and good to hear yeah, that. Yeah, it's like I want to be a real climber. That's my goal, you know. I don't want to be a tourist in the mountains. Yeah. So for my Bob Peak expedition, I'm going to have base camp support, but I'm going to be independent on the mountain. So I'm making all my decisions by myself and I have to carry all my gear. I won't have a porter or a sherpa or anything carrying it for me. Um, because I want to become a real climber. Um, yes. And I mean, it's it takes time, you know, to get mm -hmm. the experience. And uh, this is still for me like a trip where I'm mostly looking for experience uh, to see how will my body react on a high mountain like this? And how will I be able to handle the situations with the experiences I have? Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, we will see how it goes, but for me, it's not all about getting to the summits. It's about getting the experience. Okay, good on you. So, I really, it's talking about experience. I really enjoyed your blog about Alma de Blom. Beautiful oh, yeah. mountain, <laughs> beautiful mountain, extraordinary climb. Can you yeah. give us a little detail about that expedition? Yeah, so that was a dream climb of mine. Oh, and, yeah, um, mine too. Haven't done it yet. Yeah. Oh, you have to. Oh. It's amazing. Yeah. And, um, I signed up for it right after my 49 Peaks project. Mm -hmm. So I have only been climbing for like a year and I was originally supposed to go there and climb three 6,000 meter mountains like Lubuche and Island Peak and Mera Peak, you know, mm -hmm. easier one. But then I was like, no, I'm just going to go for Amadabla. Mm, and good. Was, yeah, way to go. Dream Mountain, you know. Yeah. And I went on an expedition with uh, adventure consultants. Okay. And it was just uh, so nice. I mean, the whole experience, and we had the most amazing weather on the summit day. And oh, you I the weather! Say, you, I yeah. mean, your photography on that climb. I mean, it's <laughs> fabulous. I'm like, it, everything looked perfect. Yeah. It was oh, such yeah. a really the cool. The sad thing is that on the summit day you climb in the dark, so you can't really see anything. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Typical. So yeah. you don't see the exposure. You don't see this amazing environment. Yeah. But then when you go down from the mountain, you're like, oh my god, did I climb here this morning? <laughs> wow. Yes. So small. Exactly. But I remember that the last 300 meters, it's a steep glacier. Yeah. That was really hard. Like you take 15 steps, then you have to rest for one minute, and then you do it over and over and over again. And I imagine that's how it's going to be on Broad Peak. 
yeah. because um, I've been researching and it's steep from base camp to the summit. It's never any easy parts, you know, it's never flat or anything. It's just steep all the way up. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> How? But I remember also like sleeping in Camp 2 on Ahmad Ablam. Yeah. I mean, you see in the photos, it looks Epic. crazy. And it is, it is totally, totally. crazy. Yeah. Uh, the tents, they are not flat at all. They are like 30 degrees yeah. angle. Yeah, you're rolling and out you have, of your tent. Yeah, you have this big boulder that's blocking you from rolling over the edge <laughs> in the middle of the night when you're sleeping. Yeah. Wow. And <laughs> unfortunately, there's also poo everywhere in Camp 2. So I went out in the middle of the night in my inner boots and I had to pee. And then I come back into the tent and my tent mate, he says, oh, it smells so funny. And I'm like, why, what? And then I just, yeah, you know, put my foot into the poo and uh, <laughs> throw it inside the tent. So yeah, watch out for that when you go. <laughs> Classic. My question is, how technical was this climb for you? Uh, obviously, you know, you're saying you didn't do Island Peak, you didn't do Labuche, which are usually stepping stones mm. for Amin de Blom. And yeah. most people don't really have the courage to st step in onto that and reasonably thinking. Uh, how technically te technical was it for you? And have you had any other climbs that required that level of skill? Yeah, so I did climb a few technical mountains in the Alps during that fall before I go. Uh, like the Matterhorn, um, yeah. and I led that climb myself. And uh, when I got to Ahmad Ablam, there are fixed ropes, so it's not alpine style, you know. And I thought actually it was easier than I expected due to the fixed ropes. If you would have climbed it alpine style, it would be another thing. But I was like, climbing Matterhorn is way harder okay. uh, because then you have to make all the decisions yourself. You have to, you know, yeah, lead you the have, climb when you're very, doing. You don't have someone, you've got all your ropes on Amade Blom. You just tie in and, and yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. I right. mean, there's still climbing. I mean, I climbed everything without holding on and pulling the fixed rope and my Jumar except the yellow tower. Because when you get to the yellow tower, it's like a 25 meter vertical wall mm -hmm. and you can't free climb it. But the problem is that there's a line of people standing there waiting mm -hmm. to get up this little steep part. Mm -hmm. so, you don't want to delay this line, so you just pull the your Juma and your Juma up this mount tower. But except for that, I was trying to not hold on to my Juma, I just pushed it for security, and then I free climbed on the side um, just mm -hmm. to get a little bit more of a challenge because I think it's <laughs> fun when it's not technical. Um, yeah, me too. That's what I want to climb in the future. I just need to gather more experience, you know. But if I would climb Ahmad Ablam again tomorrow, I would definitely go alpine style and I would climb with a partner and we would lead the climb ourselves. Nice. Yeah. All right. That's great to hear. Yeah. I yeah. saw you simulated uh, Everest in your uh, backyard there uh, during COVID mm -hmm. because you couldn't make Nepal because of, because of COVID. You couldn't make Nepal. I think you were planning on an Everest trip. Uh, I'm not yet. I can't afford Everest. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> Nepal is open cool. again. When are you scheduled to go back to Nepal? And what's on your list for climbs? Do you have anything scheduled for yeah, that? Yeah, I do. I do. Yes. I was actually posting an image of um, uh, the airport in Lukla today on my Instagram because they have massive cravings to go to Nepal right now because you see the Everest season is uh, going on and mm -hmm. is going there. And Pretty exciting. Yeah. I want to be there too. Yeah, me too. Uh, but I'm going this fall actually. And um, I'm going to start with just warming up uh, and do Le Boche just because I'm taking an assistant with me and mm -hmm. he never climbed the big mountain before. So yeah. we're going to trek the Everest Base Camp, climb sure. Le Boche, and we're going to make two vlogs about how you do this. And uh, then I'm going to say goodbye to him and catch up with another climbing partner. and. We are planning to try to climb a mountain called Kusum Kanguru. Say that again. Kusum Kanguru. Okay. So it's in the Kumbu Valley. It's mm -hmm. one of the first big mountains with glacier that you see on the right side when you trek to Everest Base Camp from Lukla. Okay. And it's uh, 6,000 meters something, very technical. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to attempt it in Alpine style. And um, I don't think it's ever been climbed by a woman before. It only has a few really? ascents ever. Far it's up. not one of these popular ones. So 
that's something yeah. that is, is very exciting to me too to try something that hasn't been planned that yeah. much you know that doesn't have like a freeway track up to the summit you have to really find your own route to go up there you know yeah, yeah. great that's good stuff so yeah well uh there you go i think that there's uh, one of our questions like uh have you climbed an incline peak so that's uh we're gonna watch out for that <laughs> for your <laughs> Well, it has it, been climbed it, before, it, but uh, I don't think any woman has. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. For the woman. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but other from that, I haven't climbed any unclimbed peaks yet. I still feel like kind of a rookie to climbing. You know, I only been climbing for four years, and even if I climbed a lot during these four years, I still feel like since I didn't grow up in the mountains, this is new territory to me. So yeah. I hope there will be unclimbed peaks in the future for me. Um, oh. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in the Himalayas, you'll never run out <laughs> of unclimbed peaks. Exactly. So, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. really yeah. the beauty of the Himalayas. There's so many unclimbed peaks, and yes. Yeah, yeah we spoke to a, a guy by the name of Luke Smithwick. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Do you know Luke? No, unfortunately He's not. kind of, he, he's not well known in the big climbing circles, but he's pretty pro prolific. He's kind of under the radar, mm -hmm. but in the last 10 years... He's climbed 71 unclimbed peaks oh, in the wow. Himalayas. He, and he's That's an alpinist. He's, he's doing some amazing stuff up there. And he also skis down a lot of them. So wow. he climbs up and then skis yeah. down. And he's got yeah, some really that, cool stuff to talk about. So cool. we'll yeah, I just, just love skiing, so I'm just still struggling to yeah. turn yeah. outside the slopes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've seen your climb with adventure consultants. Um, have you climbed with any other big mountain outfitters? And if so, do you have a, you know, preference or favorite? So I climbed with them two times. Okay. Uh, first time I went to Aconcagua and then on Amadablam. Mm -hmm. But that's the only guiding company I climbed with, actually. Hmm. Uh, and yeah, I climbed with Elbrus Force on Elbrus. Um, but other from that, I always climb by myself with a climbing partner or a friend that's a mountain guide, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For real. And I mean, 2018 was the last time I climbed with Adventure Consultants. And I'm going to Broad Peak uh, and have base camp support with Thardenbach uh, Adventures from Austria. So that would be a new company. But other from that, I prefer to try to climb by myself. But in the beginning, I needed the experience from going on a real expedition, you know. Mm -hmm. But take Aconcagua, for example. I've been three times uh, because okay, it took me three didn't know times that. to get to the summit. And the first time I went on the expedition with adventure consultants. And then the next year, I went back by myself alone. Okay. So I just, it was me in the mountains alone. But the weather was really crazy that year, so no one made the summit when wow. I was there. And I turned around at 6,200 because it was a total whiteout and a snowstorm. Yeah. And I had way too little time to make another attempt. Um, so I had to go back home. So the third time I went uh, with an independent expedition. So I asked friends, hey, I'm going back to Aconcagua, you want to join? Mm. And uh, yeah, we had the most amazing summit day. We had plenty of extra days to really time that weather window and it was just a uh, super nice climb. Far out. When you went yeah. solo on your second trip, did you, uh, did you, uh, what did you rent the donkeys and go across the, uh, did you do that yeah. all yourself, organize your donkey exactly. and then? I, I uh, had base camp support, which means that um, I had the donkeys taking my bag to base camp mm -hmm. and I also had food in base camp, which is amazing because I hate eating dry freeze food for more than one week. <laughs> and that's all you eat on the high mountain. You know, when you leave base camp and you go to higher camps, yeah. you have to eat dry freeze food. And if that goes on for longer than a week, I'm just fed up with it. So I'm happy to eat proper food whenever there's a possibility. But the problem was that I had this super big tent. That was a rookie mistake. Okay. I had a North, a North Face VE25. That's like a huge tent for three people. So it took up all the space in my backpack. So I always had to walk two times between the camps to go with my loads. Oh. That was just so crazy, wow. you know. I go from camp one up to camp two. 
I dump all the stuff. I go back to camp one, <laughs> get the rest, and go up again in the same day. So and you, you know, were, you you were all the super stuff. acclimatized. <laughs> <laughs> so you know when you see all the expeditions like they just carry their day pack someone else is carrying everything yeah. for them yeah and then they come to camp too and they have uh, someone who is serving you pizza and tea and you can just sit down in your tent and relax mm -hmm. i had to go down again to <laughs> up like, pack. can i have a piece then of I pizza had to fight in the storm mm -hmm. to put up my tent this huge tent all by myself and it was just flying away you know the storms in Aconcagua they are crazy yeah <laughs> flying away I could barely handle it and then when you finally battle your tent and it's set then you have to melt water you have to melt snow for two hours to be able to eat and drink so it was a lot of hard work yeah, but it was like also it. very rewarding in terms of the it's experience you got from it. you really I'm not bringing that huge tent on the high camps yeah, on Broad Peak. No I have way. a smaller one now. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Your picture is kind of frozen there. Are you there? Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. My picture is frozen. Wait. Yeah. Oh, let's see. There we go. I'm Thank back. you. <laughs> yeah. Who Sorry. needs a studio engineer? We got you. Good job. <laughs> we, we thought we, we lagged up. Okay. okay. So, obviously, photography and blogging is has been a big part of what you do. Tell us a little yeah. bit about your digital kit, your cameras, your computer, yeah. your comm, while you're yeah. on the move. How do, you, how do you put that all together? Well, I have a brand new laptop because I took out my uh, jet boil and I boiled some pasta in a hotel room two weeks ago. And it just boiled all over the place in the room and uh, my computer was drenched in pasta water. Mm. So, so I had to get a new laptop. And I'm that kind of person who bring my laptop to base camp um, to be able to edit photos, to be able yeah. to work on remote and everything. Um, when it comes to camera gear, I found the last couple of years that the lighter and smaller, the better, actually. Mm -hmm. Because uh, my first time on Aconcagua, I took my DSLR with a big lens. It was four kilos in total. Mm -hmm. And I dragged it up to 6,000 meters. And you're too exhausted to sure. use the big anyway. piece of gear. So I took maybe 15 photos or something, and I was like, never more. So now I have this small digital camera. It's like a Lumix G100, and um, this just works really well for far out. What's that camera called? And, What's sorry? that camera? Name that camera again. What is it? Uh, it's a Lumix G100. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Okay. What were you using yeah. when you were on uh, Amade Blanc Mask? What camera? Yeah, so a lot of, um, what was that? That was like a Canon M50. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, right. that's yeah. kind of a lot of gear more. there. No? Yeah, okay, right. Easy. Sweet. Wow. Yeah, exactly. So it's been lighter and lighter for every expedition, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's, you're really becoming an alpinist. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> during your our Everest uh, summit attempt, uh, we were advised, we were strongly advised to bring a as a backup the manual operated um, camera you know like with the oh, film wow. and ch -ch -ch -ch. It, it, well we had we had a digital camera with us um, yeah. but just in case it freezes yeah. up and it's stuck up then you can have the manual yeah. and actually they said this is really this is really happening this is really good advice because you know summit yeah. pictures pictures up there in the summit are really important so uh, you should yeah. really be very, yeah. very sure. Have your so, backup. Yeah. Do you still, uh, how, do how you do you deal? Backup? Yeah. Do you, do you bring a backup or do you have such thing as manual operated cameras during your climb? So I haven't used that yet, but also I never been higher than 6,962 meters. So maybe those extra thousand meters or more yeah. makes the whole difference, you know? Um, I was thinking, I always have my phone as a back backup. It always works really well in cold environments. I never mm -hmm. had a problem with it. Um, but I have to think about this, of course. I mean, it would yeah. suck to get to the summit of an 8,000 meter mountain and you <coughs> can't take a picture of it, but, of course. But how do, you, how, do you, how do you protect your, your battery from draining? How do you keep it well, warm? In pocket. In, in, yeah, in okay. my pocket. There's no yeah, like so special seal or... 
and then I sleep with it in my sleeping bag too. Yeah. Yeah. So same as so your I water bottle. Like to, to have it heated yeah. uh, as much as I can. Okay. And how do you charge it? Solar panel. So yeah. you I have just your plug in like a USB yeah. okay. uh, wire from the solar panel to mm -hmm. the camera. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It works well if it's sunny. Not so well if it's not sunny. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. I also always have a spare battery with me. So. Yeah, a battery bank, yeah. Yeah. So photography and filmmaking have been a constant progression throughout your career. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you any plans for producing a documentary here in the future? Um, yeah, actually for my 4,000 meter peak um, project next year, I'm going to make a, a documentary about it actually. That's the plan. Okay. Uh, I do blogging today. I have a YouTube channel, so I make small films about my adventures. But yeah, but you're, you're you also, today. you've got this incredible YouTube channel. I want to, anybody listening out there right now or watching, I want to say go check out her YouTube channel. It's super cool. You've got some great stuff on there. And obviously Thanks. you've got really good skills in filmmaking. So that's why I sort of, it's got to be going. That's the natural progression for you, I would presume. Well, I do get some help, actually. I have a few people that I work with because otherwise it wouldn't be possible. It's super hard to film yourself at the same time as you are climbing. It's mm -hmm. uh, really difficult. Actually. Yeah. 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 I know. We've we've tried that as well. Like even, you know, you got to set up the shot sometime. You got to set the camera yeah. up, do yeah. the climb, climb back down, get the camera. Yeah. <laughs> you I know. know. I know. And you, you, you do all of this like in the harsh weather and you're hungry and you're tired but you have to do it <laughs> yeah i'm trying but i always feel when i come back from the trip oh i should have been more i should have tried yes harder. yes yeah. yes <laughs> but when you're there it's like okay that's enough like i'm tired <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, that's true it's true <laughs> you've done a lot of traveling over the years do you have any places that you're that are particularly enticing you know places that really draw you and places that yeah, you really want to go I back to? I feel like, I mean, there's so many beautiful and special places in the world, but I really love the mountains in Peru. That's a place I really want to go back to. Patagonia is super beautiful too, and um, New Zealand, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's also um, Georgia in Europe, amazing. Mm -hmm. um, what else? I mean, I'm excited to go to Pakistan this summer because I've never been. Yeah, and, uh, it's it sounds okay, amazing. Really cool. We're talking to Luke. I, I got to I'll send you a link to some of his stuff, but he shoots a lot of photography yeah. as well. Yeah. But he talks cool. about that range over there, and yeah. he's got some pictures. It just looks awesome. Yeah, yeah. the whole reason I choose Rob Peak to totally. be my first eight thousand meter mountain is just because it's next to K two, so you have that view when you climb it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have a great time. So, yeah. obviously, climbing is inherently dangerous. Do you have any times that you might call a close call? If so, what yeah, happened? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. So, two summers ago, uh, I was climbing the Grand Jurassic Traverse in the Alps. And it's a pretty technical climb, but it goes over six 4,000 meter mountains. And on the second 4,000 meter peak, um, there is a big rock fall yeah. and me and my partner, we are similar climbing, uh, which means that uh, one of us goes first, put in protection and the other one goes last and take out the protection. Yeah, right. Trying to kind of and, going for speed. You're moving fast. Yeah, right. exactly. And the second two, uh, the second four thousand meter peak, uh, Dom de Rochefort, it's not particularly hard. It's like Alpine grade AB. Yeah. And it's maybe like 40 degrees angle where we are climbing. Mm -hmm. um, and my partner just traversed to the side, mm -hmm. but he didn't find a place to put in any new protection. And I just took out the last cam. So we had no protection at all. It was just oh. us with a rope between us. And then I look up and I see huge stones falling down. And I think, shit. And that's it, you know. That's all. I don't have time to do anything <laughs> because there's so many rocks coming right. down so fast that I just can think shit. That's and it. then I instinctly maybe did something like this, trying to protect myself. Mm -hmm. A big boulder hits my the back of my head, 
I pass out and I wow. just fall down. And, and my partner, and you're not tied in. You're not tied in. in. We are tied in the rope, me and my partner. Right, but the rope is just not, to him. Uh, attached to the mountain. That's okay. the problem, you know. Yeah. We don't have any protection into the rope right. at this moment because I just took out the last count. But my partner, he says this, and he reacts really quickly, and he just throws himself at a rock and holds my fall. Wow. And I think we have maybe 15 meters of rope between us. Ah. So I fall maybe 15 meters, but since it's not vertical, I fall like boom, 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 yeah. like that, you yeah. know, just Ouch. hitting Ouch. my body in different places. And he he is there holding on to me and uh, he screams for help because there's some more people climbing. There's one climbing pair over us and they are actually the ones pulling down the rocks on us, but they yeah. just keep climbing. Maybe they don't hear him or maybe they are ashamed of what happened. I don't know. Okay. But then there's an Italian climbing couple like 20 minutes below us and they see what happens. So they hurry up, you know, mm -hmm. and they help my partner to build an anchor. And I'm passed out. I, I don't know anything that's right. going on at this moment. But apparently I woke up and I asked my partner, where am I? What happened? Like 200 times over 45 minutes. Wow. And that's when I wake up. Like I'm waking up from a bad dream or something. Everything mm -hmm. is blurry. And you're like, what, why am I that's on a good. mountain? Right. How did I get here? I must have climbed. What mountain is this? You know, all these questions came into my head when I woke up and something felt off. Something mm -hmm. felt like it was wrong, you know, and I just noticed that my body is shaking and there's blood running from my head and there's a helicopter trying to rescue me. Um, mm -hmm. So I was super, super lucky because this is how you die in the mountains. Yeah. Rockfall is like a huge danger, especially in the Alps. And I got flown to the hospital and they stitched my head. And um, I just had a concussion and I was mm -hmm. beaten black and blue from the fall, obviously, but nothing was broken and there was no serious injuries at all. So I was so lucky and yeah. I know it. Um, so after this, I've been really careful with rock falls and people climbing above you in the mountain. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so that would be my question. You know, a lot of times when people take big falls and or have really close calls in the mountains, it sort of affects their climbing psyche, you know? They get a bit gun-shy or uh, fearful of climbing, and some people actually end their careers on that sort of moment. How did that affect you over time just after that? Yeah, so i always been scared of falling. Um, but I think, like, climbing and exposed to ridge, that's not a problem. But climbing a technical vertical wall, it's super scary. Yeah. So. I'm not that into sports <clears throat> climbing. I'm so scared of falling. I feel like that's just scary, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's why, I, I don't know, I like alpine climbing because it's, the climbing is not that technical. It's so many other things taking into the alpine climb that makes it difficult, you know? Mm -hmm. But I was actually out sport climbing on top rope one week after the accident because I was just like, I'm going to get back on the horse. I'm not going to let this scare right me. Girl. Um, All right. Yes, of course, I'm going to be more careful um, with people climbing above me and with rock balls, but I'm not going to stop climbing. I'm going to do this, but just try to be more safe. Yes. And speaking of safety, like the last couple of months, because the world have been shut down. We haven't been able to travel due to Corona and everything. I've taken this time to educate myself. I've done a lot of courses in rescue about avalanches, avalanche rescue, and uh, I become an assistant climbing instructor. And I've been, you know, right. just trying to to develop as much as possible when it comes to handling situations like this and be able to take better decisions in the mountains. That's really great. very good. That's great to yeah. hear. Congratulations. Yeah. And, you know, um, you are a big advocate of women. We lost you there. Yeah, I'm still here. My okay. video is <laughs> There you go. You're okay. back. Thank you. Yeah. So, Emma, you're a big advocate of, uh, of women empowerment. What does that mean for you? Yeah, I mean, 
working for equality has always been really important to me, whatever I've been doing in life, you know. And as I told you before, when I started climbing, um, all the stories I heard, they were just about these super hardcore men. I didn't even know that someone like me, a regular woman, could go into the mountains. Fashion and be photographer. A <laughs> so this is something I really, really want to inspire others and show if I can do this, so can you, you know. Mm -hmm. And if you think about how many movies are there about female alpine climbers, it's like none almost, you know. Mm -hmm. There's almost no books. There is. I mean, all the news, they are always about men. And I mean, we have to change that. And I want yeah. to be part of that change, you know? Right. And I'm never gonna be a super professional climber. I'm, I'm not gonna be that, you know, I'm not gonna be, I don't know, like Liv Samsos, who was like the world champion in climbing and then do super hardcore stuff in the mountains. He's a big inspiration of mine, by the way. Check her out. Uh, but. I'm just a rookie, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be on that level as a climber, but mm -hmm. that's okay too, you know, and that's also a message I want to send that everyone doesn't have to be professional, world best elite, you can be at any level and enjoy this, you know, and go out into the mountains <clears throat> and climb. So, so yeah, I'm trying to, to do something for the community and to inspire more people, especially women to be able to do this. Yes. Good on you. It's great stuff. It's really, yeah, it's very you. inspiring because, yes, as we know, um, climbing is a mostly, you know, gen in general, is a male dominated yeah. sport and it's, it's hard, you know, and they say it's hard and it's dangerous. And uh, yeah. so what you're doing is really an inspiration and keep doing it. And, you know, you. yes, and we, we also support your uh your cause and your advocacy and we believe in it yeah thank you so much so has in in saying that has anybody in your circle of friends or families or colleagues in the fashion industry ever followed in your footsteps and got into climbing or any ad outdoor adventure you know yeah i actually have a lot of friends that's like Oh, I want to climb too. Take me climbing. So I always do that. I try to bring people on my adventures, or I just, you know, take them on a easy climb, alpine climb in the Alps, um, to show them the mountains. Yeah. And uh, there are a few friends in fashion. I know like four or five people now that actually started climbing. So it's cool. But my family, they don't understand it at all. They won't climb. No. <laughs> <laughs> so how's that? Tell us a little bit about your family. How's your how's your support? Uh, do you have siblings? Your 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 parents? Yeah. So I have three siblings, and uh, I have two parents, <laughs> and we're from a small town in Sweden, and they still live there, you know. And um, they are not really into these outdoorsy things or adventures the same way as I am. So mm -hmm. we're very different in that way, and. Um, uh, yeah, I said that. I mean, I have their support, but I also feel like they don't really understand and they are not really liking what I do because they think it's dangerous, of course. That's and, that's, uh, that's parents. That's their job. Exactly. It's, it's <laughs> their right. job. Exactly. You know, that, that's true. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about all the, you know, dangerous stuff that I've done throughout my my life and <clears throat> I was a bit of a thrill seeker still am but uh yeah. we have kids my son is okay but my daughter I'm scared as hell I'm like no nope, no nope, she's not gonna do that <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna be one of those parents as well I'm really protective <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't have any kids by myself yet so we'll see if that will happen or not um at the moment there's so many mountains to climb so I don't yeah. have time to get but uh yeah, I, I can understand that when you are a parent, you sure. will be very protected. Yeah. <laughs> now I get my parents. <laughs> yeah. But I'm sure um, your parents are, are, are proud of what you're doing, you know. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the first Indian woman, Bachendri Pal, um, she was the first Indian woman to climb Everest. She's going to guide a five-month uh, trans-Himalayan expedition for 10 women above 50 years old. Do you have wow. 
Yeah, it's cool, right? Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any plans of pursuing such feat, like leading and guiding clients for women in the future? Oh, yes, I would love that. Actually, my dream is to become a mountain guide. Nice. Yeah, just to gather more experience. I mean, when it comes to alpine climbing, I have the I level of it. to get into the education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's really difficult to get into the education. You have to be really good in trad climbing and skiing and ice climbing and alpine climbing and a lot of other things. There's like a list of 100 routes you mm -hmm. have to do. And that means maybe 20 ski tours and 20 trad climbs, mm -hmm. uh, grade six plus or whatever it is, you know. And I'm just not there yet when it comes to the experience within trad climbing and skiing. So that's something I'm working on yeah. and hope I will be able to apply to the education. It starts every second year in Sweden, so maybe in four years. That's my goal to apply right. to mountain guide education in four years. Right. Because I would love to be a mountain guide and to take people on expeditions. And I actually do that already, but then I yes. hire IFMGA guides to help out with the um, security and everything, you know. But I do the logistics, I do the planning and the production, and I just, I love these things, you know. Right. And I love taking people to the mountains. That's so much fun. That's it cool. definitely seems like it's a natural progression for you after watching some of your films today. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's where you're headed for sure. <laughs> Looking back on your career thus far, what's been your hardest expedition and why? Ooh, hardest one. Let me think. Hmm. It's like after a while, you forget how horrible something is, if it is, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, there's been hard expeditions for sure. And I would say the solo expedition on Aconcagua was pretty Okay, hard. yeah. The weather was really bad. I mean, it was so windy and stormy that and there was so much snow. I never seen that much snow in base camp before. Mm -hmm. So it was almost impossible to walk. I remember walking up to camp one to leave some gear and I couldn't take it out of my backpack because it was too windy. So I had to hide behind the rock. And every now and then the wind kind of slowed down for two seconds. And then you like put something out yeah. and then you have to bury it on the rock so it wouldn't fly away straight away. It was just really harsh conditions, you know, and um, yeah, it was tough, but it was also nice to know that you could go through and, and do it. Um, yeah, after that hot, then, very difficult experience, you know that yeah. you, you can go that. through yeah. <clears throat> more things after that. Things get um, easier. Yeah, I climbed Chimbar also in Ecuador by myself too, and that was super cold. It was so cold. I was frozen. There's a picture of me standing on the summit and it's just it's frozen everywhere, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. and icicles uh, everywhere. Oh, so tough. Um, That's cool. But, but yeah, I mean, the expedition in Haiti, climbing the highest mountain in Haiti, was also crazy because no one speaks English and there's no roads. And mm -hmm. I had to, there's no guides or anything. And I had to hire a taxi to take me as close to the mountain as possible. And then he arranged for me to be at uh, to go on the back of some young kid's moped into the mountains uh. and wait for me while I was climbing this mountain. And the, the he, road to get there was so bad that I was he had to, just he like had going to, like yeah. this. Yeah. My ass was so smart that I cried <laughs> uh, going back. To Did the I hear that right? He, he had to wait for you? Yes. He had to wait for you. When I was climbing. Did you have any worries that, you know, <laughs> he might not be there when you get back? He will be gone. <laughs> of course, and then oh I would God. be totally lost in the middle of nowhere, you know. Oh, and wow. Haiti, um, it can be a dangerous country. I mean, it's not like Western Europe. Yeah, it's that's right. It's totally different, you know, and uh, no one speaks your language. And uh, yeah, it was just, yeah, uh, so I always had this worried feeling the whole yeah. time I was there, actually. How, how did you deal with that? You know, you're traveling alone. Um, the stigma you're a woman <laughs> um, yeah. and nobody speaks English uh, how, how 
do you, do you have any plans on how to sort of like tackle those things like you know the dangerous sides of what what may happen to you or yeah i mean i've been traveling a lot by myself all over the world and i never really felt unsafe except once in egypt and i was sexually assaulted on the streets wow. by a group of men wow. uh, but other from that i mean everywhere i've been in the world people have been really nice and welcoming and maybe i'm naive because i always believe that people are generally nice you know mm -hmm. and obviously i wouldn't go to uh, a really dangerous area um just for fun you know sure. and I also refuse to be limited by being a woman traveling by myself. So I just go out there, try to be brave and try to just um, do what I want to do mm -hmm. and not think so much about it. But then it's, of course, you're raised by it. You have to be cautious all the time as a woman. So it's in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I mean, if they would leave me and not waste me while I climb this mountain, there would be nothing I could do. I had to start walking back you know, and I had right. I was going to miss my plane but somehow I would solve it I yes. I still have a lot of faith in myself to solve situations in somehow you know and yeah. um, so I think that's also a reason why I'm not particularly scared I mean I travel all, all over South America and I didn't speak a word of Spanish and crossing the border <coughs> and being out in the wild it was just no one spoke to language. language either but somehow you just get by you know like yeah. body language and sure yeah i mean okay. wow i just don't want life to be um not as rich because i'm a woman yep. i want to have full experience and we're all gonna die one day and hopefully it's not gonna be anytime soon but mm -hmm. that's a risk you take walking out in the streets where yeah. you live too you know yes and, uh, I generally believe people are nice and if you treat people respectfully, most situations you can avoid getting in trouble, sure. I think. Yeah, yes. I agree. Yeah. So, hey, you did a lot of climbs in the past few years. Do you have any favorite pieces of gear or something that you could recommend or something you always like can't leave home without it? Um. So, let me think. I mean, it's the same with the camera gear. I'm starting to lean towards the lighter, the better. Mm -hmm. um, so I love my Arctic crampons because they are lightweight and you can climb both snow and rocks with them. And uh, they are perfect for a climb like the Matterhorn. And I love my ghost ice axe because it weighs nothing, you know? And uh, what else do I have that in my climbing gear that I really, really like? So when it comes to clothing, I really love my uh, Future Light shell layers from mm -hmm. Morphe. I think that material is a brand new one. Um, okay. It's very breathable and it's so soft. It's not like Gore-Tex. It's, it's called Chillax. Gore-Tex can be quite stiff, but the Future Light material is just so soft and it's perfect. Put it on and, really and you don't want to take it off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but then I'm a cold person, so I like my down jackets mm -hmm. and the base oh, layers. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Yeah, and um, keeps you warm. I yeah. wear mine way too often. Everyone's like, "Hey, it's too low. What are you doing?" And ah, yeah, but I'm comfortable. I like to <laughs> yeah, be warm. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just yeah. And also when you use layers, you can just take it off if you're too warm and put it on if you're cold. You That's know? right. Yeah. I'm very sensitive to temperatures. I don't like it when it's warm. Like going to a warm country where it's um, um, like 35 Hot and humid. Degrees. Yeah, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Yeah. But then, on the other hand, if it's super cold, I can't stand that either. So mm -hmm. I'm really particular in what kind of temperature zones I'm comfortable in. You know. <laughs> right. Well, we're in the summer right now, so you don't want you don't want to be in here in the Philippines. It's pretty warm today. Um, it's, warm. it's pretty warm today. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Um. So, what are your thoughts on how people can go back to outdoors, travel, and exploration amidst all the restrictions being imposed? in our current times? Yeah. I mean, I live in Sweden and we have had quite few restrictions, yeah. at least in the beginning. Now there's 
more, but you're still always welcome to go out in the nature because it's all about keeping your distance. And what's the best place to do that? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. outdoors, of course, you know, and especially out in the nature where you have all these wide, big areas. And in Sweden, it has been really trendy right now to go outdoors because you can't travel to your regular Thailand or Spain trip. So you go to the Swedish mountains instead of the Swedish forest. And I like that, that people are discovering the nature more and more. Back in back at home, yeah. Yeah, and it was also nice for me this year to explore a lot more of my own country that I haven't seen that much. I mean, I spent the whole winter traveling back and forward in my van to northern Sweden, trying to ski and uh, do some ice climbing and just explore my own country. Mm -hmm. Because I live in Stockholm and it's the same distance to go to the Alps as it is to go to northern Sweden for me. Oh, okay. So, so, so yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think that the outdoor is just going to be more and more popular for everyone all over the world in the future, you know. I think this year has taught us that you don't have to fly to the other side of the world, you know, to get an adventure. You can easily do that in your backyard. Um, so I think we changed our mindset a little bit. Sure. After. So how about any suggestions for anyone struggling with life in our current times? You know, we have a lot of people who, you know, for us, for example, we've been in uh, the Philippines, been locked down for a year. Uh, they opened yeah. up about a month ago for about three weeks and we've been locked down again now accordingly for another month so but you know also in a lot of places people are not allowed to leave their homes they've been in isolation yeah. for quite a long time and when we go to the mountains we put ourselves or when we go to sea or doing adventures a lot of time we isolate ourselves any suggestions yeah. for anyone struggling with life in our current times i would say keep dreaming plan your next adventure and just, you know, try to, I mean, climbing a mountain, it's a lot of mental strength too, you know, it's not always so fun. They call it type two fun. Uh, it's a lot of pain and suffer. And I think lockdown is quite a similar, it's the same thing, you, same process you go through, you know, mm -hmm. uh, try to just keep dreaming about your next adventure and start planning it. Like, do the research, see what kind of training you can do from home, watch tutorials to learn techniques and skills you need to be able to go on this adventure and just try to keep your hope up, you know, and it's okay to have a bad day, but I mean, it's the same if you want to climb an 8,000 meter mountain, that's not something you do tomorrow, you have to plan it as you did for three years to go to Everest and uh, it takes time, you know, yes. and uh, I think we just have to accept the world as it is right now and think about that it's temporary and we can see the light in the tunnel now because the vaccine is coming and it's going to be a couple of more months maybe but then hopefully we're going to be able to to be free again and then we can go and do all these amazing adventures so it's about not losing hope and spirit and just you know keep dreaming okay great advice well, yeah, thank you. Um, any film, uh, books, documentar documentary you want to share with our audience? Anything? Are you, are you writing a book? Anything yeah. coming up? What's happening? I just um, I just read uh, Elizabeth Revel's book To Live from Manga Parbat. Um, there was uh, it was huge because she and this Polish climber Tomek were climbing Nanga Parbat in winter a few years ago, like mm -hmm. 2017, I think. Mm -hmm. And this, and they went into trouble. And this was the first time that we could follow a rescue on a big mountain, like real time. Right. And you had this Polish expedition on K2 that sent help. So they sent some of the strongest climbers to Nanga Parbat to right. help the climbers there. And that was just... Um, I remember that. I remember she yeah, lost her partner, didn't she? Female. She lost her partner on that climb, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. She did. Yeah, there was nothing they could do for him. Yeah. Unfortunately. He yeah, was that was a year, a year ago? Months. Two years ago. Maybe two years ago, I think it was. 20, yeah. 27. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. So that one was really, really, really good. Uh, I can really recommend that. Okay. And um, 
then I would also recommend, let's see, uh, the K2 Ski Descent uh, that Andre Bagiel from Poland did two years ago. That was also like amazing. What an accomplishment to ski right. down K2. Yeah. And the fun thing is that he climbed it without oxygen. And he was so strong and he just walked past people with oxygen on the way up with his skis on their back. <laughs> and everyone else that was coming, they were like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah, who is this guy? The animal. <laughs> yes. Right. Sorry? This, who, they're all going, who's this guy? Who thinks this freaking animal? Savage. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was crazy to see. So yeah, that one I can recommend too. Okay. And, but, um, but do you have any, uh, and, uh, personally, are you writing any books or doing any films? actually wrote a book that came out last year oh wow um, okay that's what we want to hear unfortunately it's in swedish so um mm -hmm. there's no english uh, translation or anything so um uh it would be difficult for people to read outside sweden well we have um, some friends here from we've in our even in our little village i can pass it on we have some friends that are from sweden here so let us know yeah. we'll, oh we'll wow talk. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I we also we copy. also want yeah send send us a uh, um a link or uh how how will people find people it find that book yeah, for even sure. in, in, in your we'll own put language. it in the resource section no i mean you can go to my brand new website that i actually released a few days ago and there's a link where you can get what's the name of the new website i think i was i followed it through the last one you blogged on which was the l yeah. Right, yeah, and and it brought um, me there, but I couldn't. I, what's the name of it? So You're, the website is just Emma Svensson Photo dot com. Okay, the okay. same as my Instagram name. Okay, gotcha. Okay, all right. Yeah. All right. So, what is your message for women um, who wants to follow your footsteps, who wants to go out there and conquer not the trails, the mountains, or nature, but their insecurities, their self doubts, and self worth? So I think what they should do is to find someone who can bring them into the mountains, who can mentor them a little bit, who can encourage them or like team up with each other, you know? Maybe mm -hmm. they also have a friend who's curious about this world and they can feel stronger together. Because I think sharing experiences and knowledges and just taking people in, helping them the way, because that's how you met most of the time in the outer community. Like if you want to take a step into it, there's so many like Facebook groups and everything where you can ask questions and no questions are stupid and everyone is happy to help you and everyone is super friendly. So mm -hmm. uh, if you dare to take that step, you will be greeted with warmth and you should know that. Um, and also like team up with someone if you feel insecure, do it together with someone. You can push, push each other and you can develop together and you can learn from each other. and. There is just so much joy and excitement and it's so rewarding to do this. So I really hope that fear doesn't hold you back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they That's, have to do it I'll to do it one step at a time. All right. Exactly. Great you don't advice. have to do Everest yeah. directly. <laughs> you can start with your local field, you know? Yeah. And take it from there. Yeah. So, do you have any dreams about uh, doing projects like the Seven Summits or even possibly, I know you don't like the cold, but there's some pretty cool yeah. North Pole expeditions or South Pole expeditions. Anything like that uh, on the actually, tick list? No. No. Um, I mean, when you don't know anything about climbing, you still know about the Seven Summits. And that sounds super cool. But when you start to learn about climbing, you also discovered that the Seven Summits is more like a touristy thing that rich people do. Right. Because it costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And often when you climb these mountains, it's the expeditions that take you to the summit. And I want to be a climber, not a tourist. That's my goal, you know. Sure. So that's why I'm into other um, challenges. Yeah, I think that's great to hear. Mainstream ones. Yeah. Um, I think that's great I to mean, hear. When I, when I look at climbing myself, like over the years, those sort of climbs weren't really for me. And that was because, one, I like to be on mountains where there's no crowds. And, yeah. uh, and there's a lot, a lot of climbs out there that haven't been done or as challenging or more challenging. 
and uh, so yeah. and to pay the kind of money you pay to get on a lot of these mountains is just not really feasible. But yeah, that's yeah. sort of my philosophy as well. Yeah. So I get it. Yeah, I mean it's a cool challenge and um, sure. attraction to it, so people do it, but it's not for me. Yeah. yeah, you're you're sort of going out there and you want to do the stuff on your own, and most of those are big guided trips, and it doesn't make sense for yeah. some people. I get it. Yeah. Exactly. Do you have any uh, plans of uh, going out in the sea? I don't know. Uh, any sailing uh, dreams? Sailing? Any? I, I don't know if you know uh, Todd's <laughs> history, but uh, he has uh, sailed around the world without an engine. Oh, so, wow. That's super yeah. cool. And I really admire people who do that because uh, it seems really hardcore, like oh, yes, crossing the Atlantic Ocean by yourself and stuff like that. But I get really nauseous when I'm on the boat, <laughs> so I couldn't do it. I'm too seasick. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we want to talk about hardcore. I'm, I got to bring this guy up. Have you heard of uh, Erdin Erk from? Well, he's originally from Turkey, er, but then Eruç. Okay, I, I said. <laughs> no, unfortunately not. Anyway, so he he is uh, doing the six highest summits in the world, but by human power. So he. Oh, yeah, I read about him. Yes, yes. Fucking oh. animal. He was on our show a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he and I really get along. One because. You know, I, I did a lot of sailing and working out the logistics and talking about stuff. And so I sort of get where he's at. But he's going to take off on Earth Day. So I'll give him a little props while we're talking about him right now. He's going to leave on Earth Day. He's going to paddle across the Pacific Ocean from San Francisco to Hong Kong. And he'll arrive in March. So it's about a 10, 11 month row across the ocean. He arrives in Hong Kong. And he'll get on his bicycle and he'll pe he'll pedal to the uh, north side of Everest, pedal, mm -hmm. bike, boot, walk, however, and then summit Everest and on he'll head towards overland to uh, the mountain in Russia that you climbed, Obras, yeah. right? So on and so forth. Yeah, but this is another. Oh, oh. He's already got six of the summits done on his first five year circumnavigation. He's my age, 52, I think, and he's going to go out and try and finish this project. It's a 10 year project, but it's pretty insane what people are still doing out there today. <laughs> <laughs> Respect to him. Like, totally. It's, I mean, we had a weird biking from Sweden to Everest. So this is his story. He's, was it, it was, yeah, it was him. What's his name? He died. Yeah, he died. Yaran uh, Krok. So, yeah, he died with er Eridan, the guy I'm talking about, was his belay partner. Oh, wow. Yeah, you yeah. talk about giving me chills, right? Like, yeah. so yeah. They, he inspired yeah. him. They're, they're climbing together in, uh, I think it was Leavenworth, Washington, and he fell to his death, and Aradin said, I'm picking up the torch, and he, yeah. and he started this yeah. dream. Like, uh, life, life's too short. Th that moment that happens is life's too short. I have to do it. He, Just flew, do it. he flew to Sweden, uh, went mm -hmm. to the funeral. You know, they, they were really good friends, and then he yeah. changed his life and went on this incredible journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. World. Yeah, all respect to him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing, amazing human beings out there. So, yeah. going to follow. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll send you some links as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Emma, I think we're running out of time. I think we're gonna wrap yeah. it up. Uh -huh. It's been really nice to yes. talk with you guys. Yeah, really enjoyable. Great getting to know you. What an incredible soul you are, and such a brave oh. person. And yes. we are looking forward to watching where you're going in the future. So we'll be following and staying in touch. Yeah, you're a beautiful person. Oh, you're yeah. very strong. And we are really, really um, supporting what you're doing. And thank you for uh, gracing our show. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Take care. Stay in touch. Good luck with your, your next yeah. expedition. We'll be watching. Thank